Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. I hope you can all hear me because I just turned the audio on. Um, if you can't hear me, please shoot me a note on the through the system so that I can make sure that that problem. So I'd just like to thank everybody for attending today, those who are here in person and also the people online. Um, we're very happy to share the emerging findings from our study. Uh, before I start, I'm just going to let you know the outline for the presentation. I'm going to talk first a little bit about um, the two aspects of knowledge translation interventions that we need to always consider, which are number one, what is the knowledge being translated, and number two, how did we go about translating the knowledge. Then I'm going to talk um, in detail about the study that we did, both how we did the study, so the research aspects, and what we did, so the substantive aspects of the wor workshops that we offered, and then tell you a little bit about the results that we had from the intervention, and then talk, um, wrap up by talking about what's next. So if you have questions at any point, please just post them in the chat. I am muting everybody uh, just so that the audio can stay clear for the recording and at the end there will also be time for questions in case um, you have any at that point. So I'll just get started with the first slide. If I can figure out how to forward the slides, there we go. So I just want to start by um, giving some acknowledgements. So one of the important aspects of this study that I'll talk a little bit more about as we go along is that family members were actually co-researchers in this process. So they weren't just participants, but um, actually helped to create the workshop series that we offered, which was a really important aspect of the study. I also want to thank the research trainees and staff who helped uh, with the research because um, research is always a big undertaking and you depend on your team to be able to get it all done. I also wanted to acknowledge the study site leadership and the staff at the site because I have to say, in this kind of research, um, it does require a fair amount of courage on the part of the site because as we work with families, one of the main things um, that they leave the workshop with are questions about their relatives' care. And so the leadership at the site and the staff kind of need to be prepared and understanding for that um, eventuality. So um, I'm very grateful to them. And then the last is our funder, which was the Canadian Frailty Network. So this was a pilot study funded through one of their granting opportunities. And I will talk a little bit more about what's next at the end in terms of the future of this kind of research. So just to um, give a little bit of background, not too much, because most of the people joining today work in um, long-term care is that over 250,000 Canadians live in residential long-term care in Canada. And we know that families are uh, making significant contributions to the care in this sector. I'm just going to pause for a second because Hilda has indicated that their audio isn't working. I don't know if other people are experiencing that or if it's just at the one site. So if it's just site-specific, um, we probably can't do too much for you, Hilda, but if other people are experiencing the problem, please let us know. Um, so just to continue on, as I said, families are making significant contributions in this sector, but thanks, Anita. I'll assume everybody else can hear okay. Um, but the role of families and friends in long-term care has really remained ambiguous over time, and those of you who work in the setting know that there's great uh, diversity in the ways that families are involved in care and there's also some families that are very involved, some families that aren't involved at all, and there are those residents who don't have any family to be involved. So I acknowledge that um, at the beginning of every presentation I do because I think that that's an important aspect of how do we engage with this important group. And I apologize for people that are having trouble uh, with the sound and glad that many of you aren't having difficulty. I'll try and stay close to the mic as I can. So in our own ongoing research study, we've been working on a study for the last four years that involves uh, critical ethnography in several long-term care facilities. 
So we took what's already in the literature about families and we built that in with what we've learned from our own research. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit next. So what do we know about um, how families are involved in long-term residential care? As I said already, we know that role is fairly ambiguous and that family members often feel excluded from ish areas such as decision making and also really understanding how they can best contribute to care and where the boundaries are with the paid care workers and in particular the care aides that they spend the most time interacting with. We also know that negative experiences can lead to poor mental health outcomes for families and for staff and it can affect quality of care for residents. So the areas around um, family health that are often most affected are family members can have increased depression, strain, and caregiver burden from feelings of being excluded from care. And as I said, we've taken this existing literature and kind of woven it together with what we learned in our ideal study, which is the ongoing four-year ethnography. And I'll just briefly speak to what we have learned there. So this is a picture um, that kind of represents some of the major findings. And I put a house behind it because I think it's one of the really key areas is to acknowledge that this all takes place within an institutional setting. So it's quite different than family caregiving or care work in people's own homes in the communities. But this is happening in a more institutional kind of a space. And we are all familiar with the kind of constraints uh, that can exist inside that kind of a setting. So what we've learned from our own research is that often family and staff are working towards the same goals. So working towards balancing risk and safety, navigating the boundaries of care practices. And then what becomes very interesting is when we've talked with families, families are often very focused on sustaining the individual's identity and sustaining uh, the personhood of the individual resident based on who they have been. And given all the work that we have done in long-term care around person-centered care, staff are often very focused in supporting who the resident is now. And so the challenges and sometimes the conflicts really come in when individuals are um, kind of butting heads around that. So whereas the family may be trying to sustain the personhood of the person that they have known for many decades in particular family roles, the staff are really trying very hard to support who the person is now and who they're evolving to be in the context of dementia. So this is where we often see conflicts arise. So I'll leave it there in terms of what the literature and existing research says about the role of families and their responsibilities and involvement in long-term care. And now shift to talking about the SENT study where we actually conducted an intervention around these issues. So the purpose, sorry, I'm just having, okay. So my slides are, I'm missing one of my slides, or a couple of my slides, but that's okay. Um, I'm just going to pause for one second um, and just ask my technical expert for a moment. When I flick to the next slide, it's not the slide that comes up on here. But that's okay. They're, oh, okay, they've just maybe gone a little bit out of order. So um, I'll just continue on and we'll see what happens. Um, so the purpose of the study was to pilot a collaborative knowledge translation intervention with families in long-term care. And our key research objectives were to identify areas for education, peer support, and networking for families. And this came about because when we were doing our ethnographic study, families said to us what we really would like are opportunities to um, spend time with other families. So we see people walking around the hallways, but we haven't met them. And it's important here to say that the site that we're at doesn't have a family council. We would like education around some really central areas uh, in our relatives' care. And we'd like opportunities to kind of build relationships with other family members. So that was the focus of the study. 
And then um, we embarked on a journey to develop and implement this workshop series that we co-created with the family members and clinicians. And then we assessed the impact of those workshops. So um, when we think about, so I've talked a little bit about the knowledge that came from the existing literature and um, our own research. And then to look at how the knowledge is going to be translated is another really important piece. So we went into the literature to look at um, what intervention research had been done to date with family members, and we found that there's actually very little. So despite their significant contributions to care, in fact, very, very minimal uh, intervention research has been done with families. And again, that can to some extent be attributed to some of the challenges that this isn't a population that has sort of set times in the care facilities. There's great variation among family members about how they're involved, how they want to be involved. So it is a difficult population to do intervention research with. The interventions that have been done really focus on psychoeducational support with family members, as well as relationship building with family, between families and staff. So those interventions really mirrored the kind of work that we were planning to do. So in our study, um, one of the things that we did differently was that we invited family members to then co-construct the intervention with us. So these are the study procedures. And so this was a multi-method intervention. What we did was, and you can look at the diagram and I think that helps to make it most clear, we started with a pre-survey of all of the family members in the study site. And from that, we sort of developed the group that might be interested in participating in our intervention study. Then we came together, the researchers, clinicians, and family members who volunteered to be part of our workshop development team for a workshop development day to start to think about what should these workshops look like and what content needs to be there, particularly for the first workshop. Then we held the workshop, and then we did debriefing interviews and um, team debriefing in between. Then we had our workshop development day for the second workshop, and we continued on in that uh, sort of round robin of activities. I think that um, there were some challenges in this in terms of the intensity of time spent together, but because family members um, have sometimes a very short time that their relative actually is in a care facility, we needed that intense timeline. So the workshops, once they started, they took place every two weeks. So in between those workshops, we needed to debrief with participants and then also meet to create the next workshop. And then at the end of the study, we did the post-survey with people who expressed interest in participating, which included the part actual participants. The other thing that we did was we actually interviewed the people and observed the people who worked together on the workshop development. And that became increasingly important as we went along as it became clear that um, different people privilege different types of knowledge and how different people are included or not in the process of development is really key to this kind of research and that how we think we might be including people, particularly family members, may not actually be the received experience of those family members. So um, that were, those were the study procedures. And so in terms of the timeline, we um, did the pre-surveys in the winter, so November, December of 2016, and did the analysis of those during that time. We then actually did the workshop series during the spring between April and May. And then um, during the summer now, we're doing the post-survey and some of the data analysis and interpretation. So one of the key challenges we found with this timeline is that between winter and spring, and even between the beginning of the workshop series and the end of the workshop series, which was essentially six weeks, of course, residents passed away and family members no longer wanted or needed to participate in the study. So that's a really important thing when considering planning something like uh, intervention or some kind of education series with families in this setting is that um, it, once you get that ball rolling, you need to move pretty fast because they may not be with you by the end of the study. 
So in terms of the setting and the participants, the study took place in a 90-bed owner-operated long-term care facility in Vancouver. And the participants of the people that we surveyed, so um, almost 90 people, we sent the pre-surveys out to residents' primary family contact persons. So some of the residents, of course, had the public trustee as their uh, co primary contact. So we did not send it to the public trustee. But for all of the residents, we sent it out. We ended up having 36 uh, completed and usable surveys return. 11 family members participated in the workshops. And then um, since we've been doing the post-survey, we've had 19 that came back, eight of which were people who participated in the workshop. And then we also had four family members who participated as part of the workshop development team. So in terms of the family members who participated, and these are the people who sent back the survey but didn't necessarily participate in the actual workshops, you can see that most were retired and the other um, largest group were people who are working full time. So that had implications for participation in the workshops. In terms of education, it was a fairly affluent and well-educated group. Most of the people had post-secondary education. We had more women than men who participated in the survey. Again, that's not surprising considering what we know about demographics and caregiving. And then in terms of age, um, interestingly, 18 of the people who returned the survey were under the age of 64. So I would consider that to be quite in a younger category. And then 16 were people who were between 65 and 79. And then we had a couple of people um, to, uh, a couple of people who were um, over the age of 80. So in terms of their relationship with their resident, uh, there was sort of a split between um, being a child and being a spouse in terms of the majority of those surveys. And most of the people who responded to the survey, their relative had a primary diagnosis of dementia. The resident's uh, gender, there were slightly more women than men, and their age was around 80. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about uh, the pre-workshop survey. So this is the one that we sent out to all of the residents' primary family contact prior to starting the workshop series. And so we sent out uh, 82 because there are 82 residents who had a family member and the other eight were individuals who uh, had the public trustee as their primary contact. We received 36 usable surveys, which was a 44% response rate, which is actually an excellent response rate given that we did minimal follow-up with family members. And the survey had three sections. We asked them for information about themselves that I've just presented in terms of their demographics. They, we asked them what their workshop preferences would be, and we also had them complete something called the Family Involvement and Importance of Family Involvement Scale. So the, the topics for the surveys that we originally came up with were things that came out of our ideal study. So they were things that um, family members had identified through this ethnographic study that they would like to know more about. And so we used those as sort of the main areas for ranking, and then people were asked to also list other things they'd like to know about. When people asked about other things that they'd like to know about, they actually all fit within these three categories. So we ended up just um, sticking with them and then putting those other areas that people were interested in together with it. So what most of the participants wanted to know more about was communicating with staff about resident care. The second highest area of interest was understanding the progression of dementia. And then the third highest was managing responsive behaviors. And so I'll just make a brief comment about the understanding the progression of dementia. Several of the family members who participated had actually attended a lot of Alzheimer's Society type uh, workshops. But talked a lot about how much of the information was about the early stage of dementia. And once their relative was living in a care facility, what they really wanted to know about was how the progression was going to look, what advanced dementia looks like, and what end-of-life care looks like. And so I think that was really a central area and thread that went through all of the workshops. And um, the family members 
not only wanted to know this because it helped inform their care for their relative, but also help them understand the other residents who are present within the facility. So I'm just going to talk about this family involvement and importance scale for a moment because I think it's a really valuable tool and has a lot of potential uh, to be used in long-term care. It was developed by Dr. Colin Reed and Nina, Dr. Nina Chappell. Um, and Colin is still on faculty at the University of British Columbia in Kelowna and works quite closely with our team in terms of using this scale. So what it is, is it's 20 items and people who are filling it out basically say um, the extent to which the statement is present in the facility currently and the extent to which it's important to them. And it's a four point scale and it includes uh, strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, somewhat agree, and strongly agree. And so the types of statements that um, people are responding to is, I feel like I'm involved in decision making about my family member's care when he or she cannot make decisions for themselves. And so they answer that four point scale in terms of the extent to which it's present in the facility and the extent to which it's important to them. Another statement is, administrators have asked my opinions about the quality of care provided at this facility. And a third question is, I feel comfortable phoning staff members and talking to them about how my family member is doing. So you can see that these questions are incredibly practical. They were actually developed through research, doing research with families in long-term care. So I think this is a really valuable scale in terms of learning um, quite specifically where your facility kind of is in terms of how family members feel about what's currently happening and what's important to them. So the results of the scale um, for the facility that where we conducted the study was that there was a significant difference between what families were currently experiencing and what was important to them. So you can see that the average score on the scale of what's currently happening was 49.8 and in terms of what was important to them it was 61.6 and the highest or best uh, score that you can receive on the scale is 80. So there was a significant difference, meaning that the facility can look at those statements individually and as a group and think about ways that they could practically, in a practical manner, improve care to be able to um, make that gap between what's currently happening and what's important to families much smaller. So that was the results of the pre-workshop series, and then this is now moving into the content on what we actually did. So once we got the ball rolling, uh, we met with our family members who were the co-creators of the workshop series and talked a little bit more about the different um, content areas that families were looking for. So that area of learning how to communicate better and more effectively with staff became the first workshop, which was being an effective advocate. And the second workshop around uh, the progression of dementia and some of the challenging behaviors or responsive behaviors became understanding the progression of dementia. And then the third area that um, partially addrew, addressed the issue around behaviors, but also what do I do with my relative as their dementia advances and they are less engaged in activities with me? That was the workshop that became Making Moments Meaningful. And that was the final workshop. The workshops were offered on Monday mornings because that was the day of the week and the time of the day that most participants asked us to have them. When people came to the site, we spent the time between 9.30 and 10 just doing registration and having coffee and making, um, checking in with everybody who was attending that day. Then from 10 to 12 was the actual workshop where we sat together. And then from 12 onwards, we offered lunch for people, but they didn't have to stay if they didn't want to. We just made sure that we always had food available for them. Um, and so that was sort of the flow. We did ask people uh, initially to sign up for all three, which we saw as ideal in order to see if there was any impact of the workshop series. And as you'll see, that part didn't work out very well. So in terms of the workshop participants, you can see the picture of their uh, demographics for the people who actually ended up attending. And apologies to the people who are here. I'm just going to hopefully 
shrink the part where we see, there we go. Okay, so as you can see, it was still a fairly well-educated group. Um, there were more women than men. Uh, not surprisingly, the majority of people who had ended up attending were spouses because children who are in that younger age group probably couldn't attend due to work commitments. Um, but all of the people who ended up participating, their relative's main diagnosis was dementia. So of the 11 people who signed up for the workshops, five attended all three workshops, five attended two workshops, and one attended one workshop. So in terms of each of the workshops, I'll just go through uh, what they actually looked like and what we did. So being an effective advocate, you can see on the screen we provided a picture of what the room looked like. So we were in a, you know, a very nice room that had space for both a small kitchen area where people could sit and where we served lunch afterwards. But then we, when we actually have the workshops where you see the R3, R6, um, and the F, those chairs in sort of the U shape or the oval shape is how we came together when we were sitting together for the workshop. And for each of the workshops, there were a certain number of what we'd call researchers present. So we had some of our research trainees taking notes on what was happening. And the Fs in the circle are um, the family members. And that changed each time depending on who attended. So in terms of the outline for this particular workshop, we started with welcome intro and introductions. It took a very long time to get through the introductions because people needed to tell their story. So that's a really important piece, I think, of working with families is giving people space to tell their story. And that took up a good half of the first workshop was just people needing to tell how they had ended up in this particular place with their relative. Um, we then talked about the who's and what's of communication. So even really simple information like what does OTPTCA, RCA, RN, LPN, DOC, NC, MD, NP, what do all of these stand for? Because a lot of family members say, I have no idea who these people are or what they do or who I'm supposed to talk to about what. So um, we talked about uh, what all of those abbreviations mean. We also talked about if you have a concern, what is the ladder for that? So who do you talk to first and where do you go if um, your concern you don't feel is being addressed? We talked about the legal framework for decision making because all of the family members who are present were substitute decision makers for their relative so that they could really understand what that means and the implications of um, being named that on a representation agreement. And then we added some additional resources for advocates around, in particular, taxes. Uh, one of the family member participants was quite an expert on CRA and had some suggestions around that. So those were the things that we covered off on that first uh, workshop. And then we had some feedback sheet questions and also did our debriefing. So I'll share with you what came of it from the highlights, from the feedback. So um, one of the first things when we talked to people, uh, they really enjoyed the opportunity to share stories around their caregiving and to compare their journeys. So that was a piece around support, I think, that came through very clearly, was that opportunity to actually talk to other people who had gone through similar things. Some were very eager to highlight the need for systemic reforms. Um, people were also very pleased with learning practical information that they could take with them. So one of the things we found was that after each of the workshops, people left with a bit of a script. So what, you know, how do you ask that question? And even things as much as, you know, having, you know, how your nonverbal communication is important in terms of approaching different people about any uh, concerns or questions that you have. And then what was really surprising to us was that at noon, we thought people would disperse, but actually people spent a fair amount of time staying for lunch. And we found that across all three workshops, that even just given the time to spend together after having an opportunity to share their stories, have some education, people actually sat for over an hour and just talked to each other. Some of the things they thought could be improved was that um, they wanted to hear more of, of the researchers in terms of insight and expertise. So this is where we were kind of looking to figure out what's the sweet spot between having opportunities for people to share their own stories, to share their own expertise, 
and actually um, kind of settling into more of a didactic lecture type approach. So we didn't quite get there with the first uh, workshop for sure. Um, and then the other piece was that some of the stories and the personal storytelling went along a bit long. Uh, and so one of the other key aspects of this is you have to have a skilled facilitator. This is not something everybody is able to do or has experience doing, but you need to have a skilled facilitator who is able to keep things moving along so that you don't have individuals taking up a lot of space in the workshop to tell their personal stories. The other thing that um, the people who particularly had gone to the Alzheimer's Society workshop said was that um, the information was either repetitive of what they had heard in the Alzheimer's Society groups, or they would have appreciated this particular piece much earlier in their caregiver journey. Um, because a lot of them felt at the point at which their relative moved into a care facility, it was kind of, they had already gained experience being an advocate. I can't say that was consistent for everybody because other people, of course, love the content. So in a way, it makes you reflect, do you have specialized groups? Do you have orientation sessions for families where you share this at the upfront part? Um, or do you sort of be more clear around this particular workshop targets people who are new here or have been here for a while longer so that people can consider a little bit more whether or not the content would potentially be useful to them. The second workshop was understanding the progression of dementia and we are very fortunate to have Dr. Liz Drans uh, help facilitate this one because this is where we got very content heavy and talked a lot about what does the advanced stage of dementia look like. So for this particular uh, workshop we started again with the welcome and reintroductions. We tried to keep it briefer there were some family members who had not been at the first workshop, so they told their stories a little bit longer. Um, but we tried to keep it a little bit more uh, contained so that we had time for all of the content. I always ask the question, what would you like to take away from today's workshop? Because there's no point giving a workshop for two hours and it wasn't what people were thinking they were going to hear. So making sure that we attended to what people's priorities were. And then the content was, um, talking about from medical to relational care. And for those of you who may have seen Dr. Drantz give presentations before, she does a wonderful job of this, really explains um, sort of the medical aspects of dementia, which I think for some family members was really the first time they were hearing it in that way that was very accessible for them. So that was wonderful. Um, we also talked about the pieces program, which again was very helpful because you can see, although we didn't go through all of the different areas with family members, that center circle was the script that many people left with that day. So when they were told by staff, oh, something, you know, your relative's not doing well or they've changed or da-da-da, that they could go and they could ask questions. What is change? What might be causing it? What have you done to look into it? And that in itself was a real nugget of um, a real nugget for family members to even have the language to say when somebody comes to you and comes at you and says something's happening, you know, how do you respond to that besides just being silent? So they found that incredibly helpful. We talked about medications, the good, the bad, and how to decide. We did not talk about uh, the pharmacology of any of the medications. That was beyond the scope of the workshop. But even thinking about how do you ask questions about the medications your relative uh, is on and giving people permission to do that. And then we talked about the later stage of dementia. We ran out of time a bit to talk about end of life care. So I'll be going back and um, meeting with some of the family members who want to do that to talk about uh, specifically about end of life care. So for that workshop, um, we changed it, our evaluation a bit and we used a sheet that's called Two Stars and a Wish. And I thought this was really great and it came from one of the researchers. And it's when you're giving a workshop or other teaching session that the evaluation form says, you know, tell us two stars and then having a break uh, of white space for people to write down two things that they thought went really well and a wish and that's sort of the what could be improved piece. And that was a really nice way of asking that question. So from this particular 
uh, workshop some of the feedback that we got. Again, people really appreciated the opportunity to share their personal experiences and hear other people's. They really liked having that expert knowledge from Dr. Drantz so that that could help um, them consider what was happening in their own relative's experience. And they also um, really liked because they were able to better understand certain care plans. So when staff would come to them and say, we're doing this or we're trying this, that family members felt like they had a better understanding of what the rationale for some of those decisions might be or have questions around why that was happening. Some of the wishes, people wanted more time and a longer workshop. I think that's always actually a good thing for workshop presenters to feel that people could have stayed longer. Again, there was issues around some of the lengthy discussions um, that some individuals had experienced with the system. And again, that goes back to effective facilitation and being able to create space for that, but also ensuring it doesn't take over the workshop. And it was really difficult for some of them to take in all the information because it was very content heavy for that particular session. So then the third um, workshop that we did was making moments meaningful, spending time with your relative. So this is a picture of our lunch afterwards where you can see all our happy faces, relieved that our workshop series is finally coming to an end and went really well. But that sort of gives you a picture of the space and that's where we're sitting at the lunch table and you can see behind it where the chairs are was that circular space where we had sat for the actual workshop. So in this session we again did welcome and reintroductions, talked about what would you like to take away from today's workshop. And this session um, when we looked back and we again through our um, debriefing and then our workshop development time with family members, we realized this was really about two different things. One thing it was about was how do you take care of the caregiver? And the other piece was around making moments meaningful for everyone. And so we really needed to spend some time acknowledging the work of caregiving that continues when a person's relative moves into a care facility. Many of the caregivers, you know, had experienced burnout and strain and really needed to express that in a supportive group and also talk about, you know, how do you take care of the caregiver in this type of situation? What do you do for yourself? How do you create that space? And then we had taken um, examples both from the participants and also from the literature around what kinds of non-pharmacological interventions are effective and can be done with people who have advanced dementia. So, that was a great example of how we used existing research and literature and paired it with people's personal experiences to be able to give quite a long list of ideas. And one of the family members actually brought with her the poster board she created for her relative where it had pictures of him at different stages in his life with notes on it so that the, relative, the staff could really get to know her relative. And so that was an activity that um, was really lovely because she brought examples and she was able to talk about how she felt that it influenced how staff were interacting with her dad. Um, and some of the other things we talked about were going for walks or going for pushes uh, if the person was in a wheelchair, getting outside because oftentimes staff aren't able to have time to take people outside so that's a great way for family members to um, spend time with their relative and also thinking about not having to stay for long periods, um, giving people permission not to come every day or to come for particular lengths of time. And that also, if there were activities that they thought their relative would particularly enjoy, to be talking with recreation staff around trying to make sure their relative got to those activities, even if the family member wasn't there. So those were um, the highlights from that workshop. And again, we asked for their two stars and a wish. And so this time, people really talked about those lunch times where they got time to spend together to really talk about what had happened. Another participant said the workshops gave me a voice. So I would say as a researcher, that's a success and that was something we aimed for. People felt part supported by other participants and researchers. So there were actually relationships that existed among the family members before they came and some new relationships that started. And people also really appreciated some of the suggestions for meaningful moments because they didn't had kind of run out of ideas of what to do. Again, 
a consistent theme I think we'll never eliminate in terms of areas for improvement. Some people still felt people told the same story repeatedly at each workshop. And I think this was a reflection of how traumatized some people were of what had happened in their journey with their relative through the healthcare system. So it's really important to give people space to tell those stories, um, and some of them will have to continue telling them again and again. People, um, this time it came up more around the desire for tailored information based on their relationship with the resident, and that sometimes those activities or Caregiver self-care depends on your relationship with the person who lives in the facility. And of course, um, people wish there was an ongoing workshop series once a month, which um, I think is a great piece of feedback for this particular project. So then what we did in terms of further evaluation, we sent the workshop survey back to the people who completed it to begin with, those 36. So just to remember, 11 of those had participated in the workshop series to some extent, and the others had not. So these are the uh, post-workshop surveys from eight of the people who actually did attend the workshop series. We asked them which workshop was most helpful in terms of their relationship with their relative. And so here it was fairly spread out that people um, liked all different ones, and some people liked them all. You can see at the bottom um, here, two of the participants actually abstained due to the death of their relative, and so that was an issue, again, in the process of this workshop series and a reality of doing research like this with this population. And then we asked them um, what participants felt was most helpful for their relationship with staff, and so not surprising, um, or maybe a bit surprising, sorry, the progression of de dementia. And when we asked and dug a little bit more about this, it was that by having a better understanding of uh, their relative's disease process, they were better able to understand the type of care they were receiving. So this was actually a really key piece for people to know and understand. So um, in terms of some of the qualitative feedback we got from the workshop participants, six of them uh, noticed the change in their involvement at the facility since the beginning of the workshop series. We had one, for example, family member I remember who left one of the workshops ready to call the director of care where her relative lived and have a meeting just to, because she now had questions that she thought were meaningful about their care plan and understanding it better. One of the participants said, I have been less involved in my father's care and held staff more accountable. Um, and that was a person who was doing a lot of hands-on care and as a result was pulling back a little bit on that and spending her time with her relative differently. Six out of eight of the participants created new connections with families where their relative lives. Another said, I found it very helpful to see how others have problems and solutions I didn't really know too much about. Comparing stories to my situation opened my eyes and provided ideas of what I should be doing. So again, being able to hear about each other's experiences in a facilitated manner was really helpful. Um, and again, another one said uh, that they were able to communicate more effectively with staff and the administration, which meant they could have more relaxed time with their relative, which is what families really should be doing when they're visiting their relative in a facility. Um, and two of the participants connected outside of the workshop with other participants. And so in terms of networking, we were curious to see if people would um, initiate contact with each other outside of the structure of the workshops. So in terms of the people who didn't attend the workshops uh, but completed the post-survey, of them you can see four of them, their relatives had passed away and four, um, had, they had transferred to another facility. So that was eight individuals who completed that first survey who had already had a change in their situation from the time that we started the workshop series. And then the reason for non-attendance, the main issue was the time of day, which again raised questions for us around um, whether there are different needs to be a, an evening offering, perhaps for a younger group of caregivers who are working during the day. So just before I wrap up, some of the considerations for next steps. Some of the main uh, lessons that we learned from the workshop series were that, as with any group that you bring together, family members bring different learning styles, personalities, and experiences to the group. 
So it's important for the facilitators to have some expertise around teaching and learning strategies so that they can be meeting the needs of a broad group of learners. And again, as I've already said a couple times, it may be better to have groups based on different family relationships or at different times of day to accommodate people who work full time. We will be offering this workshop series again in 2017-2018 uh, because we have an Alzheimer's Society grant to do that. So we'll take what we've learned from this experience and refine the um, study. We're going to be conducting it at two sites, one urban and one rural. Um, and we're going to also try to collect data about other types of interventions that would be helpful. So some family members would have preferred if we had just sent them a DVD of recordings of the information from the workshop series. Others might like more use of social media. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit more time and collect some information about that. And we'd also like to expand the number of sites involved in the survey because I think there's very important and practical information uh, that sites can take, even if they don't participate in the workshop series, to learn from that family involvement and important skill. So just uh, the final slide is that contrary to some research and anecdotal information, family members do want to be involved and are willing to participate in facility-based activities. And I particularly see this in relation to family councils because we've just finished a province-wide survey of family councils and oftentimes the response from administrators is, well, family members aren't interested. And so that's why we don't have a council. And I think actually it may be more of a flaw with family councils than actual interest in participating in something. And so again, the further research is needed to consider ways to include more diversity um, of family needs and to develop the capacity among family members to lead workshops. Because we certainly had one or two family members in our group who would be excellent leaders of the workshop series. And to expand that role of co-creation, not just in the um, actual planning of the workshops, but in the delivering, which we offered continually, but it depended on people's willingness to do that. And none of the family members, with the exception of one near the end um, in the third workshop, wanted to take on that role. But I think these are actually um, workshops that don't necessarily rely on staff and facility support, but could be quite uh, self-sustaining by a group of family members if they wish to do that. So that was the presentation. Thank you, everybody, who has stayed on the line. Um, are there any questions or comments about what I've presented? We have about 10 minutes, I think, before the end of the webinar. Any from inside the room? Yes? So reading between the lines, it seemed like guilt or, or sort of that, you know, a lot of the family members needed that time to talk and process how they felt about the transition their family member was making. Um, did the facility have a family counselor available for these people to talk to? And could that be one way to sort of help them do that? That's a great question. So the question is whether or not, because a lot of the families need to repeatedly tell their stories, um, was there support available at the facility? So I would um, say I don't think that family members felt guilt. I think they were traumatized by what the system had done to them. And so unfortunately, um, the, they didn't have a, I don't think that family members have a lot of trust to give those stories to people working in the system. And a lot of that trauma comes from their time in acute care and it's not actually from their time in long-term care, but from the experience of being moved and how that first available bed policy works and through other mechanisms that their relative came to be in a long-term care facility. So I think that some of them, it, what they liked was being able to tell the story to other family members and a neutral party that wasn't part of the system. And so I think it, there's great potential for those kinds of groups. I think it should be families together because people need to hear each other's stories um, and would be a wonderful thing to offer uh, because I do think just the act of telling the story over and over and over again was healing for some people and they felt like they were heard for the first time. 
So thanks. The other question online is, do we have any resources for demonstrating the stages of dementia suited for families? Um, I can't remember. I think that we had focused so much on the sort of end stage or advanced dementia with the work that we had done. We didn't have uh, something to give to families, but that's certainly something that we can look into. When each, after each workshop and at the end of the workshop, we had put together a package for families of different pieces of information that they really wanted. So an example of one of the pieces that we put together, put in our package was the most form because most family members don't even understand what they have signed or the implications of it. So I think definitely giving people that kind of information in an accessible manner is so key. And so that's a really great idea. Um, and we can look online and share that with the group if we can find something that would be suitable for families. And there's one more. Would you be willing to share the content of the workshops? We can for sure. I would tell you it was interesting. Each workshop is comprised of about four PowerPoint slides and facilitating conversation. So I'm happy to share them. I don't know how helpful they'd be um, because it actually took about half an hour per PowerPoint slide even to just talk about something like substitute decision making. So yeah, we can definitely share those, but it was an interesting kind of experience in terms of, it was almost like um, oftentimes we would have the researchers who are nurses or um, Dr. Drantz, who's a physician and a psychiatrist, uh, just to, I guess it's almost like brain picking and people actually being able to have this opportunity to talk to people who have the experience um, and that clinical knowledge in a safe environment. Um, but yeah, for sure we can, we can share more of what we did. It was really neat. You can hopefully tell that I was excited about what we did. One more down, down now. Oh, thanks. Susan has posted that she has content from Interior Health to share. So um, we'll make sure that gets out. Oh, and I'm just seeing if there's another question about family councils. I think that in terms of um, family councils, I do not think that family and joint councils are effective. I think residents and I think you can have a joint one, but you need to create space for families on their own because they need to talk about what's happening with residents in a way that is not in front of residents. So I think that's an important piece. Um, I think that part of what draws people to family councils is knowing that there is a purpose. So when we look at our family council study, and we'll be doing more, we'll do a webinar about those findings in September, I think having a guest speaker where there's actually some education happening is a real draw, because most people feel like if I'm coming to a council meeting to listen to people complain about the soup one more time, that's not why I'm coming. So. A lot of people feel that the Family Council can just become a complaints headquarters. And so I think what one of the draws of this workshop was, was to be able to have uh, ed some education and then the opportunity to actually look at each other as family members, talk about your experiences, and support each other. And I will say that during those support conversations, I can't recall any that were specific about particular staff. It was actually almost always the story of how their relative came to live in the facility. And so that was a very interesting aspect. Um, so I think that the councils are effective, but we need to think about how do we make them accessible to people and interesting enough to come to. And I think the education, if people offered an education session on what is what is the progression of dementia look like, um, what can you do when you're spending time with your relative who has advanced dementia? All of those things, you're probably going to get people attending. So I think that our time is up. 
I just would like to thank everybody who took the time to join us. This is recorded, so we'll be posting it and uh, circulating the link. And if you have any other questions or comments that we didn't have a chance to get to, please just pop us an email. And you can see the email address is jero at nursing.ubc.ca. And that comes straight to me and to the wonderful research staff at the research unit. And we will get an answer for you. So hoping um, you all have a great rest of your summer. And we will be offering another webinar in September about our family council. So look forward to hopefully getting to spend some time with you again then.